So you were really mean last time, Lon. I was just totally, you know, how can we be friends? You deserve last it. podcast. Yeah? You think? I made a serious, I made a serious investment of time in those books. I I thought this was going to be a fluff piece. I thought it was understood that you were just supposed to say wonderful things about my books. Softballs, slow just, rolling grounders. You just my savaged buddy. it. Just I awful. did. And then, I, then, I, your, I, then your little friends came and sort of huddled around you and protected yeah, you thank from God. big battle. Oh, my God. I'm Pathetic. really glad we didn't do that, just the two of us. Okay. <sighs> we have a guest today. Our guest is John Chin, and he is a composer, a jazz composer, composer and pianist uh, living in New York. And he has four, four albums out, one on the way, I think. And... Um, We've been listening to his stuff, and it's just tremendous. Um, uh, Juilliard graduate, am I right? Um, yes, no? it happened. That okay. did happen. Okay. It um, happened. It happened. <laughs> that happened. Yes. Uh, and um, anyway, we're going to talk about his music. And, you know, let me just say straight off, I'm not like a, a jazz critic. I have no vocabulary for jazz. I, 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 I like things. I don't like things. It's all you uh, know. Okay. So that's, that's what I that's, think. That's what I'm working with. Lionel might know more about how to talk about this. Um, I'm definitely very curious about your influences, about what that noise is that just came from Lionel's connection. <laughs> it was an amber alert. Sorry. Oh, that's wow. actually oh. kind of important. So let me just turn this off. You're, you're turning off the amber alert? What if somebody, what, what if the person is in your, in your room? <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. I'll, it's gone now. I, okay, all right. Can we keep going with the show? We can go on. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, anyway, uh, I love your stuff. It's uh, it's fantastic. I've listened to it. Uh, I've listened to it while I was working. I've listened to it at home. I've, I, I find uh, some of the works are fantastic on the weekends for some reason. They're, it's like excellent weekend listening. Um, I want to know... I guess I want to know, let's start at the beginning. How did you get, how did you get involved in, in writing this kind of music and playing this kind of music? Oh, uh, what, what's, what drew you to it? And, and, you know, how did you find your, your place in, uh, as a, as a jazz composer? Man. Um, well, um, I guess a little background, uh, uh we, we couldn't get the jazz radio station in, in, uh, where, where we lived. Um, and so I, I guess it had been in sort of around, you know, like, 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 um, wh I remember early on sort of loving the Saturday night, uh, night live band. I remember mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And just like, you know, when they would do the end of the show and it'd be like this sort of gospel, slow gospel thing. And it'd be really sentimental. And I remember that. And I remember like, um, Ray Charles doing Pepsi commercials. Uh -huh. and uh uh and uh and him singing um you know america the beautiful and 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 georgia and sort of being in touch with aretha franklin there was something about that sound and mm -hmm. the instrumentation and uh that was early on right it was just kind of like it was on national television it was like everywhere yeah yeah and that's you know that's me at a very young age and so and i had also sort of uh played piano my my parents didn't force me to do to to play piano i, I just sort of did it you know i mean i don't know how did many you have decisions lessons like, were you or did you have like yeah, a, you I know the I horrible, lessons no <laughs> the horrible piano teacher uh, that i had <laughs> no <laughs> i uh my first piano teacher you know he was he was nice he's lovely you know he's just and and he he just made me have fun and then and then i quit oh, nice. and then and then i and then i started again and and I was into it and, and, and my parents, you know, they, they were just like, Oh, do you like doing this? Or do you want to stop doing this? And it was just, it was kind of my decision. So, um, time went on and then, uh, I had, uh, we would, we would go spend the night at my mom's friend's house and I was a little older and I would, I had a, I would buy a, 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 a pack of blank cassettes mm. and I would go over and they got the radio station crystal clear and well, i would record station? the radio 
can I ask where this was? Where, where, where this are we is, listening? This is uh, in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And the station uh, at the time uh, was called K, uh, KLON. Uh-huh. And I think now it's called KJazz. And um, out of Long Beach. And uh-huh. at the time, it was very low wattage. And we didn't get it. And so finally, yeah. you know, we'd go down there and, and uh, we'd go down to Orange County because we lived in L.A. And uh, radio station came in crystal clear. So I would tape the radio. And so I would, I would uh, you know, come back home with like this arsenal of jazz music. Um, and, and can, you get closer to to your, can you get closer to your mic? I'm sorry. To oh, yeah, sure. No problem. Um, in my face. And so um, <laughs> I, I just like... <laughs> I, uh, uh, I just would, I would listen to it. I, I don't know. I don't know how it happened. You know, my parents didn't listen to jazz. My dad is a classical music buff. My mom liked, I remember she had like a Perry Como album LP and like sister sledge. Mm-hmm. And, um, wow. and, and, and that was like, and some Korean music and, and that was like the vibe. And then there's television and, you know, I'm a child of the eighties. So like, there's a lot of TV happening. You know, yeah. Saturday morning cartoons and, and, and Johnny Carson and all of that stuff. Oh, yeah. And Johnny Carson's band. Right. Right. Doc, right, right. Doc Severinsen, you know. And somehow I just got drawn to it. And so so th- so the thing is, is that I would eventually when I was, uh, I don't know, maybe I was 10, 11, I would start to try and learn to play songs off the radio. And at that time, there was a jazz radio station, quote unquote, jazz radio station called The Wave. It's like mm-hmm. smooth jazz, you know, like this kind Kenny of, that G. kind of vibe, right? Yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so there were songs on there that I really liked. And then I liked um, David Foster's music. He did movie music, you know, it's just like your super melodic music. And I would learn how to play this stuff by ear on the piano. And it was like, mm. just like a fun thing to do, right? And, uh, and so then... So then I came across these tapes that I had made and I'd listened to it and I, and I remember listening to a specific recording of Ramsey Lewis playing the in crowd. And it was like the energy was so funky and it was like bluesy and it was like everything I wanted. And I'm trying to figure it out and, and it's bluesy and I'm kind of getting it, but there are parts that I, I couldn't figure out. And yeah. then it sort of led into this other jazz that I was trying to figure out by ear, but it was way too sophisticated for me, like mm-hmm. for my ear, I couldn't figure it out. Mm-hmm. And so um, and then, uh, and then like, I'd hear all these musicians, like you, you listen to jazz, you, you know, you hear these saxophone players, you know, it's like, a, it's like a million notes, right? right. So fast, right. Yeah. so many things happening at the same time. And in my mind, I'm like, what, how is this possible? Like, there's no way in my mind, there's mm-hmm. no way that these jazz musicians know what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like, right. this is totally random. This is totally random. And then of course I would go to the piano and I would like randomly move my fingers on the piano and it would sound terrible. And I'd be like, what's going on? How come this, this isn't making sense. And of course, later when I sort of had some instruction and someone told me, well, actually these musicians know every single note that they're playing. They're conscious. Yeah, they're of called everything seventh chords. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, and so, what, you mean and so a chord with four <laughs> notes, <laughs> who came up with that? <laughs> I just, I just was, I was blown away. I was like, are you kidding? And, and that, and it just turned into like, and then at that point, jazz music was like this ultimate, ultimate music for, for my purposes, you know, to like become versed in this incredibly sophisticated harmonically and, and, and rhythmically, you know, this just like, that's the ultimate and jazz musicians were the ultimate and jazz music was like the ultimate. And so, um, I want, and I wanted to do it. I was drawn to it somehow. And, and that's, that's how it all kind of started was that. That's cool. I, it's funny because, um, I did love listening to jazz when I was, when I was young, I think I just didn't understand it. I thought it was just sort of a, a mode, you know, like, like blues, like there's a, there's a modal sense to blues. If you kind of learn the scales, then you're kind of in the, in that mode. And then whatever you're playing is bluesy jazz is totally not like that. Uh, I've learned since I've gotten older and learned a few more things. Uh, my wife was telling me the other day about uh, Charlie Parker is that he might quote five different songs in a measure, you know, and that, and that's part of what's going on. He is like talking about music, yeah, but really fast. And yeah. um, uh, I mean, that might be an error too, but that, but then that opened my eyes. I'm like, yeah, wait a minute. Jazz isn't a mode. It's not a modal thing. It's, it's, 
it's everything. It's 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 uh, it encompasses um, all of the different uh, keys and modes. Um, yeah, it's it's language. It's basically language, yeah. you know. And and just like and it's just like this genius. It's 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 freestyle, right? It's improvised. Mm -hmm. There's a structure, and it's I, I don't I don't know. I mean, it's uh, it's 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 everything. Yeah, it's everything. Everything. <laughs> Jazz is everything. <laughs> well, the, um, <laughs> it's interesting because because I actually watched that video that uh, you put together for the the. Sorry, I'm losing it. Uh, for the, I'm getting that age when names fly around my. Who is it? Mose Allison for the Mose Allison oh, album. Yeah. you put together that accompanying video, which is like a five minute video, which I thought was great. I love that video where cool. you talked about making the tape recordings of the jazz station when you went to yes. your relative's house and things like yes. that. Yes. And so, um, yeah, those magic moments, you know, it's just, it, there's something exotic about it. Something, you know, you, the fact that you have to go somewhere else to get it. Um, it's like, it's, <laughs> it, it, it has a weird, you know, it's like that weird resonance we have in our heads when we're kids and we go, you know, we, we always went to that lake house. You remember that lake house we used to go to and it had that really mm -hmm. you know, magical feeling to it. So that's something we should probably put on the links, Jim, um, is the yeah, link to that. Absolutely. YouTube actually, thing. in my, in my research, I did not come across that video. I'm looking forward to, to seeing it. Yeah. Richard Julian, um, is on the absolutely Mo's. Wait a minute. Is that the right, is that the right title? Anything Mo's. Uh, anything Mo's, uh, album. Um, uh, I think I know Richard Julian. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Was he a songwriter? Yeah, as he, he's a songwriter, right? Yeah, I yeah, know him yeah. from the fast folk days, um, oh, wow. and that was yeah. kind of exciting to to hear him. So, what um, what did he what his instrumentation on on um, the Mose on album? anything Mo's? What is he playing? He's, he's playing that? guitar and he's singing. That's singing. wild. Oh, it's yeah. his voice. It's his voice. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's and he sounds yeah, a lot like Mo's. He yeah. really does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of yeah, yeah. It's yeah. kind of spooky. <laughs> it really does sound a <laughs> lot like Mose. Well, but Mose, Mose is big for him. You know, is it's definitely a, an influence for him. Um, so he he yeah. I mean, it's just part of who he is. I think as an as an artist, you know, it's one of his well, one of his people. Yeah, the interesting thing about Mose is that he's not some inscrutable bebop god. This is Mose um, Allison. Yeah, Mose Allison. He's. He's a guy banging on a piano, writing something that comes perilously close to like Weird Al Yankovic or Tom Lehrer. <laughs> um, and so, and so, you, well, but it is. It's very clear yeah. to understand. They're very funny. Yes. I mean, he's not doing parodies of things, but they're very funny, and it's very, and he's very engaging, and you get sucked into it, and it's very transparent music, and you think, oh, this is just some goofy guy banging on the piano singing about you know your molecular structure. And then you realize he's really got chops. His yeah. lyrics are really good. Yeah. Um, and he's got this vibe that is just absolutely unstoppable. I was thinking about this. I mean, Mose Allison sort of reminds me a little bit of punk in the mm -hmm. sense that one of the great things about punk music is that you listen to it and you say, I can do that. Right. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can play like the Ramones. Can't be three that notes hard. on a bass. It's like yeah. three chords in a thing. And like with Mose Allison, one of the great things about somebody like Mose Allison is you listen to that and you're like, yeah, I understand exactly what's going on in this song. I, I, there's, there's no overdubbing. There's nothing. It's not a, it's not a million miles a second. It's really accessible, and so people love Mo's because it's very comfortable. But it's deep. It's not trivial. You know, it's, it's not trivial. It's he's, he's talking some really good stuff. So I, what, what did you think, John, when in the process of doing that album? What, 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 what you know, what was the process of that? And did you come to any, any conclusions about Mo's? Well, I mean, I, I remember my, my first Mose Allison record I, I had bought in a used record shop in Pasadena, you know, just because I had heard, I had heard your molecular structure on, on jazz radio at that time. And I was like, this is the greatest, this is the greatest it's a wild song, song ever. Yeah. And, um, and, and it was just kind of, it, it always been there, you know, and I love Mose for the, for the same reasons. I feel like everyone loves Mose. It's, it's, it's just the lyrics and, and, and just the relatable uh, quality about it and, and, and the blues quality about it. And, and, um, and after I had listened to it, you know, I was a student, I was maybe, I don't know, 17 or something, 17, 18, actually, no, I must've been 16, 16. And, um, 
And so putting the album together, the thing is, is that I, I had admired Richard for, for years. He, Richard had mm-hmm. been on the scene in New York um, since well before I got there. And I remember there was a club in the Lower East Side called The Living Room. And he oh, sort yeah. of had resident, he had residency over there. Like he was there kind of every week, I feel like. I think he had a run where he was doing every week. And I would go. And this was around the time like Nora Jones would go, you know, and, yeah. and, and there were like a bunch of singer, uh, singer songwriters. And he was kind of a guru of sorts, you know, like he was like this guy. He, he wasn't signed to a major label, but he was amazing. And it was all, he was kind of, un- he had like, there was an underground thing. And then he would do a show and he had incredible banter, I remember, um, on stage. And it was just like, the, it was, it was fantastic. And so I would go and I always admired him. And so my drummer, that I had been playing is his drummer, same drummer, Dan mm-hmm. Reeser. And so um, Dan would play these gigs with me. And then sometimes Richard would show up to the gig and we'd talk and we'd chat and, and whatever. And this is well before the Mose Allison conversation happened. And then like somewhere down the line, I was just like, you know, this would be really fun. And I'd love to work with Richard and Dan, you know, Dan's my homie. And why don't we just try this? And it was just supposed to be a bar band. It was just like for fun. It was just, uh-huh. we were just going to like play bars for tips, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> just, just like do these songs for fun. It was, it wasn't supposed to be anything. Right. And, and so, and, and just, it just, we, we had been planning to put the record out before COVID, but of course COVID slowed everything down and the lockdown happened. Um, but I, I just, making the record was um, the actual making of the record was um, I was filled with anxiety. If I'm, if I'm going to be frank about it, filled with anxiety. Why is that? Because, well, I was, I was, I was, you know, I'm, I'm producing the record on top of playing piano for the record. Right. And so I'm sort of in this situation where it's like, I got to make sure everybody's cool and happy and that the uh that the sound is good and i got to i got to make sure that everyone's you know like i i got to make sure the music is in order and then i got to make sure that richard is cool and richard richard in the studio he's like he's a wild man in the studio you know he's like huh. he showed up he showed up with like a a megaphone you know mm-hmm. and i and, and i was like <laughs> what <laughs> what are we going to do yeah, uh, what is, <laughs> i was like i don't know what to do this. and he was like he was ready to go full like mad scientist in the studio and just like go nuts and i was like and all this music had been written out and i thought we had everything worked out and you know and so i'm like oh my god i and and so now i, I felt like Oh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta manage this. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, I don't know if this is going to work. And, and really my attitude should have been just like, well, fuck it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Can I, can I say that? And so yeah. I was just like, you know, all right, let's just, but no, because I have this, I had this, like, I had just so much on my plate and I felt like I, I was just like the worst, <laughs> worst version of myself, just like micromanaging everything. And then on top of that, the anxiety of having to deliver when, when the red light comes on. You know, right. And just like, I gotta yeah. go. I got those are I two gotta... different people, right? The producer yes. and the musician are two exactly. different people. And you were doing both. And you I were doing, doing a little uh wrangling, it sounds like little yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and artist and management. Like, yeah, yeah you, exactly. You three people. Yeah. And you had one. <laughs> 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 this is very familiar. Oh, this takes me back <laughs> to the studio. Yeah. Yeah. So he shows up anyway. with bagpipes. <laughs> what, what are those for? Like, <laughs> jazz bagpipes you know and it's like it's it and that and that side of richard is like it it's it, it drives you crazy but it, it is also like his strength it's also the most like inc- amazingly lovable super creative part of him right. you know and so it's just like two sides of it it's like is this going to turn into a hot mess or is is genius about to emerge you know what i mean like i don't know and so anyway, I'm managing all this and then the red light comes on and I'm supposed to like, yeah, it's another person. And, and like, I'm supposed to deliver on my, on everything, you know? So, <laughs> so yeah, um, making the record was, um, uh, was terrible. And, um, <laughs> wow. That's but it came word. out great. It's a fantastic record. Um, I want to play a clip. This is the tri- clip I chose from that record. Um, this, this, I t- totally dig this song partially because of the song, but I also just love, I love the recording. Just 
just one big trouble spot Some have plenty, some have not I used to see trouble Until I finally saw the light Now I don't worry about a thing Cause I know nothing's gonna be alright Yeah, you can totally hear all your tension and uh, anxiety on that. Thing. <laughs> yeah, it just comes cutting this through. This comes right through. I can. Your fingers seem a little stiff. stiff. No, no, it sounds fantastic. And that's. Yeah, uh, I don't worry about a thing, or is it called "Nothing's Going to Be All Right"? Um, um, I don't worry about a thing. I don't worry about a thing, and yeah. uh, and that's off of absolutely mo. Uh, sorry, no, not absolutely. Anything Moe's. Why do I anything, anything Moe's? Absolute. 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 Doesn't make any, zero. Doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, that's off of anything Moe's. And um, and they're all like that. It's just because, yeah, it just it, it, it's wonderful textures, wonderful music, great playing, great, great performances. Richard sounds fantastic. I thought it was you actually singing, but um, that that just uh, that's a great it's a great album. Also a great entry album. If you want to get to know the music of John Chin. And Moe's um, so was that the first take on that? Did you do multiple takes um, and stitch them together? Or did you try to do like one take per song and just choose the best take all the way through? Or did you actually splice tunes? Or I, I think um, some of them just happened naturally. Some of them, yeah. Some of them we had to like, well, there was one where we, I decided to add more horns. Um, okay, so you did overdubs. So we did overdubs. And so yeah. like um, I, we went from a single horn to a horn section because we wanted to do have a New Orleans feel on it and have a full sort of oh, second that's line. That's right. Thing. That's and right. So, oh, that's um, um, the one of the famous song yeah, that I grew uh, up with. Your, mind, your, your mouth mind's on vacation. Vacation. But and I yeah. listened to it. I was like, oh, my God, we're walking down Bourbon Street here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, it, the whole thing sort of. It sort of wheezes to life and then starts rolling down the street. It's great. Yeah. yeah I yeah. love that. So, <laughs> so yeah, it was a mix. No, yeah. But in that clip that Jim just played, I, you know, tell me if this, if this actually drives you bonkers uh, when people say this, but I heard, I heard a lot of Vince Guaraldi there. I, I had that kind of feeling. I mean, what, who do you, I mean, do you think of people when you're playing? Do you think of, you know, are you, do you have somebody in mind when you're doing something? Um, no, you know, I mean, I guess l listening to that and you know, you're not the first person to say that oh. interestingly. And I, I can't say that, you know, as far as I, it just must have just over these past decades of Christmases, <laughs> somehow Vince Guaraldi has sort of entered into my consciousness and, and uh, really everyone's consciousness. Or maybe you guys just play the same. I mean, maybe it's not you quoting him at all. It's just, maybe it's just the nature of the rhythm of the music, but what, what kind of, what kind of piano were you playing? Uh, you mean like it, you're asking actual, me if that was a, a Steinway or something or. Yeah. I mean, was it cause Vin, cause Vince Guaraldi, Vince Guaraldi sounds like he's playing an upright half the time. <laughs> um, I think. <laughs> I, I I don't yeah I I don't I think that was a, a a rebuilt Steinway that I was actually playing and if I were to sort of just like take that clip I I would say if, if I were to say who somebody that I may have been trying to channel would be someone like McCoy Tyner just in, stylistically mm. uh, okay. for something like that um, and I yeah just just but but yeah but actually now that you mention it now that I think about it even more I actually yes I hear the Vince Guaraldi. I well, because really a lot of Vince's stuff was like that waltz stuff. It has that sort of triplet yeah, swing kind of right. vibe to it. That's right. And and it's very and so it may just be more the nature of the, the tune um and the instrumentation than any any quoting or anything like that. But I'm you know, obviously uh Vince Guaraldi looms law, you know, he's so famous. And again, sort of like sort of like Mose Allison, a very humble guy. I mean, not you know, not uh, some inscrutable wunderkind. He was, <laughs> he was a guy who banged up the tunes. Um, and so yeah. anyway, so that's a that's the one I liked um, on Undercover. First off the bat, that is talking about inscrutable. That is, I, I got to say, you really went out there in your cover of Caravan. I'm like, oh, I'm huh. like, OK, how is he? <laughs> Is this like caravan or is he just using the word caravan for something? Right. And I was like, oh, there's the melody. Oh, yeah. Wow. Right. 
Um, and then you did uh, Smile, um, yeah. which is a fabulous tune. It's just a, a I know, a, a, just a heartbreakingly beautiful tune. Jim Infantino, who who wrote Smile? Smile when your heart is breaking. Uh, I don't Smile. know. Uh, Charlie Hoagie, Chaplin. Hoagie. Oh, really? Oh, of course. Charlie, I'd heard Charlie that. Charlie yeah. Chaplin wrote it. Yeah. So yeah, what's the movie? I forgot the movie. Um, I don't remember. Uh, the one where he's working in a factory. Anyway, I don't. this this is just uh, heart stopping podcasting right now. I'm just I'm savoring this moment. Why? Uh, no, just the uh, what was the. Um, <laughs> <laughs> AARP <laughs> presents I, what? John Chin being tormented by two guys who are losing. Wasn't there it. a guy? Wasn't there a guy by the <laughs> piano? <laughs> uh, you sound just like him. Does that bother you when 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 um, when people talk about? Maybe it happens in jazz more often than it happens. I mean, actually, it happens a lot in in my line of music too. Um, whatever the hell that is. Uh, when people say, well, that, that reminds me of, or that sounds like, or this really brings up, you know, it, it, the, the comparisons or, or just uh, derivation kind of talk, uh, is, is that bothersome? <laughs> no, no, ab- no way. I mean, not, you know, I mean, if it, I mean, it, it, if it's somebody terrible, I guess, but, but yeah. not, you know, it, if it's someone, well, you know, this, this music, th- there's lineage in this music, yeah. you know, that's, that's how it works. And so it's just like one leads to the next, to the next. And so like, and the way that we learn this music is, is by listening to the masters. I mean, that's just how it's done. Yeah. And so if somebody says to me, oh, you, you sound like McCoy Tyner, I'd be like, well, thank you. you thank know? you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll yeah. take it. <laughs> I'll take it. Absolutely. Yeah. So what are you working? Uh, do you have anything upcoming? Anything, any new projects? Well, I have, did, um, did you get what? the track? We actually heard, we, I, I can't play it, but we heard a track off of the upcoming recording. I didn't listen to that one. I I'm sent sorry. it to you. I sent I, it to you. You sent me a lot. You well, sent me a lot treat, of things, Actually, dude. it's a treat. It's a fantastic, that's a fantastic, I'm really looking forward to the next track. What, do you have an idea for a title? I don't. I'm open. Mm. I'm open to suggestion. Um, it's a pandemic album. Um, it is a pandemic album. Uh, something we did in 2020, um, August of 2020, uh, Smalls Jazz Club, which is here in New York City, uh, in the West Village, had been um, sub- supporting uh, live music again e- in the midst of a lockdown. So um, the club was having concerts with no audiences and just for the live stream. And you, you know, you can watch a small's live stream every night mm. and, and just see what's happening every night, which is incredible. And, and yeah. so, um, there, uh, we, we were invited to, um, do a, a live stream show and this, you know, everything shut down, what in March yeah. and there were suddenly no gigs, no touring, nothing. And, uh, and I think this show was the first first show um of uh, since the lockdown so i was listening to again and i was like man this is because because there was such catharsis uh, Mm -hmm. in that show for us um and and just like the spirit the spirit was just there There there's just an energy about it and i was like man this is great you know it's i just i just wanted to share that with with everyone um again even though it had been sort of put on the live stream but but just to just to really polish it put it together release it and 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 just share that moment i really i mean this is you know as a jazz musician you know that that's that's what we do we just share our moments you know it's every, every night is a different show every, every note is a is a different note in a way you yeah. know and it's just like this it's it's about freedom and it's about expression and it's about being in the moment you know like i i think of, i think about it you know like that thing where like you're just in the zone you know that that and and that show was like we're just totally in the zone it's like i don't know kissing the love of your life for the first time like what are you thinking about like there's just that moment you know 
And so it, it, for us, it, that was it. Yeah. And, and I wanted to, I just wanted to share it and the pandemic, you know, changed all of our lives. And, and that was, that was, that was just one of the, one of the great things about the pandemic for me was that show. Hmm. And so are you releasing the actual recordings of those shows? Is that I the, am. okay. So you're, yes. you're just, you're taking old recordings and probably just reprocessing and making sure they're yes. okay. And then yes. reissuing those. And what's yes. the lineup? Is it just is it a trio gig or it's trio? You know? um, it's uh, with um, uh, my 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 friends, my brothers, Sean Conley on bass and and Jameo Brown on the drums. So it's just a trio show, and and we 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 have done probably a thousand gigs together. You know, so we came into that show no rehearsal. I I, I don't know if we've ever had wow. a rehearsal. You know what I mean? Wow. And so we just like we just walk in. It's like all right cool back at it let's go you know well, i've only heard one track and i just i love it i think it's it's fantastic um and i again i hate to compare it compare you to anybody and it does it's not a it's not a you know it, there are a lot of differences between your playing and his but there it definitely took me to some of the spontaneity and um uh freedom and uh, uh and just wildness of um some of keith jarrett's work mm, um in terms wow. of the way the way it came out um, but that, I mean that in a good way in that I like some of his albums a lot and I really liked this. So I think sometimes when people make comparison, it's like, I like this too. <laughs> it's really <laughs> not very sophisticated. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> funny you mentioned that because when I was growing up, when I was in high school, the big thing was Keith Jarrett, the Colm concerts mm -hmm. and everybody was obsessing over those records. Um, and I found it a little precious and pretentious. Which was really stupid because <laughs> like a month ago, I was like listening to my jazz station. I'm like, who the fuck is that playing piano? This is like unbelievable. I'm like, it's gotta be Keith. It's gotta be Keith. It's just it's it's so ridiculous. It's it's so out there. Um, and it was. And so it's funny how you know you you write certain artists off at some point <clears throat> for some stupid reason, for some stupid social reason, or because oh they're not this or they're not that, and then you come back to them later like what was I thinking? This you know I this would, guy's and I would say this and I and uh, you know not this is not a dig at Keith Jarrett. I feel like he kind of he kind of his his chordal movement is not always as sophisticated. I think I think what what I heard on on the recording of the upcoming album was a lot was a lot more complex um but it also had that that sense of like i'm i'm just going like i'm totally in the moment here yeah, yeah. and that's what i loved about it yeah thank you uh, keith is one of my heroes actually for sure keith keith is like a, he's a giant he's a giant um, and he kept recording and recording and recording and recording and recording and kept recording on and on and on and on and on yeah he has yeah. so many albums yeah yeah the body of work and all the yep. things I, I don't know. There, there, I recently watched an interview, a recent interview of his, and and, and it just reminded me how 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 it just how much of a giant. There's so much output, so much different music, and and always uh, so um, so authentic and so mm -hmm. sincere, so sincere with everything he did. Uh, I don't know. It's I, it's overwhelming when I think about it. What would you recommend to somebody if like to me, if I wanted to like begin, you know, take it from the top 40 years later and begin my, my Keith Jarrett journey. Do you have any recommendation, like an album to start with? To it doesn't start have to be with. the early one. I mean, just, just to begin, I mean, it doesn't have to be like early in his career, but just, you know, is there one album that you think, boy, if, if you're only going to, if you're only going to take one Keith album and listen to it, one this Keith is the album. album. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> Well, I'll tell you the first one I, I ever listened to was Standards Live. That was mm. the first one for mm. me. And that was with his famous trio. And um, yeah, stunning. And that was it. I was like, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. And then uh, listening more uh, to that trio stuff. And then getting to know him. And he had an American quartet and European quartet. And 
he played classical music and he, and he, he did played, classical. He, he, yeah. He did like Bach albums and yeah. Very yeah. well respected. He, he does like the Shostakovich preludes and he plays uh, saxophone and, and he, play, and he, and he play, he's just like, it, it's, oh, that's, it's un- that's going a little too far. I mean, really. <laughs> Keith, come on, doll it back a bit. You're making the rest of us look like schlubs. Here. Stay oh, a little yeah. for everybody else. Yeah. Come on. Just play a wrong note every now and then. And give us, <laughs> give the rest of us some hope. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I may I may have been wrong in my in my uh, analysis of Keith Jarrett. And maybe I haven't listened to enough albums. So Standard Live, I'll put that in the references. Make sure people can can find it. I would love, oh, yeah. I would love to uh, to feature another. So these clips are one minute long, um, and this one's off of Undercover, and it's called Fall. So um, this is this is you on piano, Orlando De Fleming on bass, and Dan Reeser on drums. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And are these covers? I don't know this cover if it is. Uh, that's this is a Wayne Shorter tune. That's Wayne Shorter. Um, okay, uh, that's Wayne Shorter. He he, um, he you know, just he just passed away. away. Yeah. yeah, and um, yeah, that's Wayne Shorter tune. And and this album, uh, this is definitely no edits there are no edits on this album this is just mm-hmm. like we're all in the same room it's just like let's just go let's just do i i ordered tacos and it's just <laughs> like okay this is going to be great <laughs> tacos Ta- yeah. yeah strangely enough my fit my the tune that really clicked with me was the one after fall which was seemingly oh. i really like that one that was good um but yeah it was a blast. I really enjoyed it. I like the mix. Is, uh, now, are all these covers or some of these original tunes of yours? Oh, yeah. Uh, some of them are original. Um, seemingly is a tune that I wrote. Um, yeah. And uh, gosh, the record. I, I have I have no idea. I, I haven't I haven't I haven't listened to the record in, in probably years. So, right. um, uh, but yeah, Listening mix, to your own record can be hard. Yeah, that's I, and also I've I've listened to it probably you know hundreds of times in just producing it. So right. um, it's like okay, let's just let's just play the gig. Let's just we'll just play the gig. It's cool. It's, so it's what totally what are you? So what kind of gigs are you doing now? Are you is 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 the sh- the band back on the road now? Now that the pandemic has passed. Well, I mean, I I I, I wish. I wish. And, uh, you know, I've been, I've been teaching actually lately. I've been doing a lot of teaching. So, um, I teach here in Brooklyn at, um, at the rock nation school of music, which is at long Island university in downtown Brooklyn. So I've been doing a lot of teaching just that right. that's by, that's been my speed. And so, um, and then playing mostly local gigs, maybe going out for a couple of nights here and there for different things. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I try and do things N- now when I play a gig, if you see me on, on a gig these days, it, you know, I want to be there, you know, that it's like, it's very intentional <laughs> and it's right. something that I believe in, you know? Um, and so, uh, I get to be a little more picky about, about what I'm doing. Um, so, uh, yeah, a lot of teaching some, you know, sideman stuff. Uh, I, I do maybe something as a leader a couple times a month right now and, and developing, developing some new music and, uh, and some new groups. I have, I have a, a new trio that I'm trying to put together oh, cool. um, with, with um, actually with some Korean musicians, actually some New mm-hmm. York Korean jazz musicians, something I'd never done before. And I just, I wanted to put that together with these guys and, you know, it's, there are not many, 
Korean jazz mm-hmm. musicians in New York City. And uh, I, I, for many years, for decades, I felt like I was the only one. That's what it felt yeah. like. And so, um, so finally, there are a couple that showed up. And I'm like, oh, you know what? Maybe we should try this, you know, and just kind of make some music together, but also just, you know, give some shared experience yep. um, in, in that perspective and being an Asian jazz musician uh, in the United States, in New York, and, and just what that is and what sort of things you face and, and, and make music from, from that vantage point. Sort of a shared. Yeah, you'd, you'd written an article about... Um, uh, Things that had come up being an Asian uh, jazz musician in America, um, specifically American, I don't know, how, how to, uh, of Korean descent, right? You're an, you're an American born here. So, right. yes. Um, uh, but, but I was, actually, actually, I wasn't born here, but oh, really? <laughs> I was, I was born, my parents were already American citizens, but I was actually born in Seoul. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, little known fact. Well, I take it back. <laughs> but so, but but born American, but still born, born American. American. Yes, in Seoul. Yeah. In Seoul, yeah. Oh. Can't be. Present. Um, but just yeah, just a lot of the the preconceptions about. I, I I don't. I'm not sure. I, I'm sure you could say better what actually comes up. Um, but the idea of like uh, what a jazz musician looks like, or or you know where what, what their background must be, or I mean, I, right. You have to have been born in New Orleans to, you know, sixth generation family. Whatever, <laughs> yes. The, yeah. Whatever yeah. the requirement is. Uh-huh. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, that that bias, that sort of implicit bias or that's that that unconscious bias that people have has got to be. Um, it sounded like from the article, it just sounded like it was something that you had to you had to deal with. Um, well, I mean, it's like, I you know. That article, you know, was came out when, as a, there was that shooting in in yeah. Atlanta with all the, uh, the massage parlor parlors and 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 so I had this opportunity to talk about sort of Asian perspective, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and I I think that when I when I see another sort of Asian jazz musician sort of make it i generally i'm like that person is is amazing because like no, nothing nothing's handed nothing's i don't i just right. don't feel like anything's handed to them you know what i mean right. they they yeah. didn't they didn't get the gig because they had a certain look they right. must have gotten the gig because they're amazing and yeah. and that's that's just what i think and, and, uh, because I don't, I mean, I feel very grateful for everything, all the great things that have come across, I've come across in my life and all the opportunities I've been afforded. I've been grateful for all of them. And, and so, but I also know that, you know, I, I, I've, I always felt like I had to, you know, I had to put it, get it together, you know? And I, and I felt like I, I can't, I can't mess up here. I gotta, I have to deliver mm-hmm. essentially. Yeah. Yeah, right. you know, every show, every time. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I was, I was ahead. on a completely different tangent. But when I was listening to your music last night, I, I, I have certain weepy times. I have when I listen to music, <laughs> and something about something about the the stuff of yours that I was listening to made me think of Samuel Barber's nocturne homage to john field do you know that piece i don't it's pretty obscure it's absolutely beautiful i'll i'll wow. send an email to jim it's only like a four minute piece and there's like okay. there's like 20 different versions on youtube um but uh okay. it's uh it's sam the barber the guy who wrote barbers adagio for strings and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff mm-hmm. right and right. and it, it's his homage to john field who i believe lived in like the 1700s and was an irish composer who actually invented the noct invented who who was really the pioneer of the nocturne form that later Chopin embraced and sort mm. of made a, a core of his of his stuff. Um, but it's a great piece of music. I just I'll I'll lay it on you and you cool. can tell me what you think. But it's well, just I mean, a magnificent what what is it? What what can 
what was it about that and what you listened to? What you were doing something. You were doing you were definitely getting your clawed on at one point. You're doing you're doing something that sounded like falling rain, almost sounded like Claude Debussy's like Gardens in the Rain or something like that. Mm. It was very high. And it was sort of like this descending high notes, sort of descending arpeggios kind of stuff. And yeah. it just hit me. And when you hear this piece, the the way that Samuel Barber uses um these arpeggios is just absolutely heartbreaking. And it's a very bittersweet tune. Um it's it it the there's massive chord changes all the time. Um, and it's constantly, it's constantly keeping you off balance. It's incredibly tonal. I mean, it's, there's, there's no 12 tone. There's none of that. There's nothing really angular in it, but he's constantly shifting. He's constantly modulating away from your comfort zone all the time. It sort of reminded me a little bit of, uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim. Sometimes in his tunes, um, he just, you think, okay, he's going to modulate here. And then he <laughs> modulates this completely different place. And it's like, okay, I guess we're here now. I, yeah. I guess we're, I guess yeah. we, we've moved, mm. we've moved next door. Um, and so, um, but it's, it's uh, talking about music is always incredibly boring to everybody because, you know, talking <laughs> about music, cause it's, it's what I always say, like the record reviews are the most worthless things in the world oh my god because <laughs> oh you read a record review like i have to get this album then you buy the album it's like oh my god this is hideous and then <laughs> you read the review and it's like oh that sounds awful and then you listen to it like this is fabulous so i yeah. i don't record reviews to me are just absolutely pointless but the piece of music <laughs> piece of music it's really cool it's really cool uh, yeah so <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah i mean yes and the record, and I hear yes. a little Steve Reich too, like in Edda. I don't know if you're thinking about that, but at the beginning of Edda, you're playing that, yeah, very, that very sort of it reminded me a lot of Steve. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm a huge sort of fan, percussion. I'm a huge fan uh, of his too. Yeah, that's yeah. another one that makes me cry. Uh, watching yeah. music for 18 musicians, oh There's my a god, performance on YouTube really? in Tokyo. It's a Tokyo oh, performance with, with Steve Reich at the piano, and it just it gets to me every single time. Have I ever showed that to you, Jim? No, oh. It's magnificent. Mm. It's absolutely a magnificent, magnificent piece. I, I'm not going to say anything about. I'm going to say anything more about. It, but it's on. I'll send you the links for it. You have to watch it. Um. Anyway, go ahead. Um, uh, John, can you talk about it. the album Fifth um, a little bit? Th this is um. This was one that I felt like I I I need to do more. Like this is like a deep listening album to me. I, I mean, maybe maybe. Um, Maybe I'm just uh, really dense, but it 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 uh, it's a fascinating it's a fascinating album. It's, it has a very different quality than the others. Um, the instrumentation is really is really different. There's as I remember, there's a lot of horns. Um, is this was this an album where you were doing a lot of the composition? Um, what was what's the story behind it? The um, well, the story. Um, the, so the musicians on the album, um, is Spencer Murphy on bass, Tavon Pennicott, Stacey Dillard on saxophones, and Lawrence Leathers on drums. And we had been doing, uh, in the midst of that record, we had been doing um, a regular gig at Smalls Jazz Club on Monday nights. And our set was usually started about 1.30 a.m., Mm. And we probably did that run for a couple of years. And so, but it was a really special, really special time for us. So, um, we, we were doing these late night gigs and, you know, it, on Monday, on a Monday night. So it's decidedly a jazz crowd, right? Mm -hmm. It's like jazz musicians. It's not really the working nine to five people, right? Right. They're not really out on Monday night at 2 a.m. And, we, and so I just remember sort of playing that, playing that show with those guys. And I just remember this moment where we would start playing and there was something that was happening on stage or in the room where the room would be completely silent. Mm. Now, this is like, this is on a Monday night, a room full of musicians hanging out, having drinks and hanging out. This is not a silent room. Okay. Right. Right. This is like yeah, this is York. party time. Yeah. Two a.m. This is everyone's weekend. 
You know, no people don't have Monday night gigs. They're rolling through. They're unwinding. They had. They're just coming off their weekend the chefs, shows. The chefs are done. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So they're in. But I just remember playing the show, and it was just like it was completely silent. Uh, and there was something, and we had something. There was something there. And even even to this day, I'll have people that would tell me about, oh, I, I was there at Smalls when you guys were doing that run. You know, and it was it was influential to you know a, a, ge- a small generation of musicians somehow, um, and so I knew we had something special. So I had to go in. I said, "We got to record this. We got to do this." Yeah. And and so that's what this record is. And so in producing that record, um, we did uh, I think a couple of days in the studio. Um, again, no overdubs. And one of the things that we had talked about was having sort of like these transitional moments in between songs. And my idea was that to have everyone sort of just play a statement, solo, improvised, totally improvised, and just like, you know, and then we'll clip it 30 seconds, and then we'll go on to the next track. So that was Mm -hmm. was the conception of it. But the solo improvisations were so good, I couldn't cut, I couldn't cut any of them. I was like, oh my God, this shit. Is amazing. I gotta, I gotta keep this. I have to do it. And so I, I just assembled it, uh, in that manner. And so it opens, you know, with Spencer playing the bass, this, and he's playing a prayer and the track is called prayer. Right. And, and it just opens that way. And it's like, you're in space. And so, um, the, the title, um, fifth comes from, um, comes from the word quintessence Mm, and 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 sort of like this this time when um this excellence was something of the stars you know and this is like an alchemy age concept and so again the album is about sort of being in that moment and sort of like just letting it go and 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 that's what the album is especially because of the solo improvisations and so um we were we and so in putting the set together there's you know there's sort of a narrative it opens with our prayer and then and then we we go into edda i think again yep yep and um and then it progresses and then halfway through the record uh the record changes and and there's sort of an act two i think i think it's with still water Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, Fender Rhodes is introduced into into the album, and then it, it goes from there. And then it hits kind of like the 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 climax of it is on a solo improvisation I did on Rhodes called Trajectory. And like speaking uh, of your Steve Reich uh, 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 influence, like there it is. There's the Steve Reich. If you listen to that track, that's like straight up. And then Undercover, and then there's an there's a epilogue which is just a blues and we're just riding off into the sunset so like there's a sort of a loose narrative happening on the album but because of the solo improvisations it's like um it's very intimate there's an intimate quality so when you listen to it it's it's as if we're sitting right next to you and so that that's the idea behind the album and also tavon and stacy are reading each other's minds i don't know how they're doing it and then lawrence as well now lawrence unfortunately um is no longer with us um, and uh yeah and i really miss that guy so um so it's extra special um since he's gone well i you know i think i got the wrong clips from this album um because i should have picked <laughs> something from the middle where things are kind of transitioning what really there were two that really hit me one was the chase and um, oh yeah it's my favorite track <clears throat> and then there are these all these tracks if you buy the whole album from Bandcamp. There's tracks that are not mentioned and they're not on the page. Um, uh, Piano Variation 5, track 18, which is not listed. Um, That one, if it's all right with you, I'd love to play in its entirety because it is one minute long. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, I was right. I need to listen to this many, many more times. The whole thing through. <laughs> I'm not going to get it for like a couple of years. It's, uh, <laughs> and I mean that in a good way. Like it's so rich. It's really deep. You can get deep into this album, and and it's, and so much of it is very like, and it's so much of it is solo. So much is sparse. So much of it is short. It it yeah. seems it just defies the convention of a regular album. It's really cool. Yeah, it's definitely um, definitely uh, conceptual. Um, and I, I'm, yeah, I, 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 there's a special place in my heart, uh, with that album because of the time and, and just the, just the, I, I don't know, the expression is to me, even still is profound for that album and, and just listening to, to the guys play there. Cause I remember I was in the booth and I'm like, cool. All right. Well, uh, Lawrence, okay. You got it. Go ahead. Like there's no direction. Mm -hmm. Just like you got it. Go, just go. <laughs> and like, and and it just this thing happens. Yeah, Savan, you got it. Good, go. And then yeah. Stacy, I'm like, cool, cool. Um, and then I'm like, cool. Yeah, let let's do another one. And like both of them were great. And I actually strung them together. And yeah. and it was it was just like I can't I can't st I can't stand it. I can't stand it. <laughs> you know, it's like but sometimes uh, the job of the producer is to not do anything. Is yeah. to just hap let it happen. Yeah. And and uh that you know, that could be hard. But yeah. It'd be great. Wow. I think we had Thai food. Thai food on that one. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, I, I noticed that the food so like if you buy tacos, do you get a certain type of performance versus <laughs> buying I mean, is because I, I write, I once read this story about how Brian Eno came to one session and everybody's kind of tense and he's and and they all went to the studio and he pulled out this huge pie and he said i made pie for everybody oh and my started god slicing up the pie and handing it out <laughs> to everybody i don't know that if that's an oblique strategy or what but every but, episode uh, has to have a brian you know story that's uh, that's one of the rules of funny not funny the podcast <laughs> yeah but it, I, I i would like I to start it oh god go ahead no, go ahead and you go ahead i just it, it's interesting because i i really i did I detect from you, John, that this is very spiritual. Like I listening to what you're saying, like you're really focused on like the spiritual aspect of the creative process. Like when you talk about it, it's interesting because I haven't heard that in a while, but you're talking about the quintessence, this emergent property, you know, it, it's, you know, something magic happens and, the, the room goes quiet and, and it's, it's inexpressible and it's unnameable, but it's there. Is it spiritual and or is it just mysterious? That's my oh, question. That's my addendum to your question. I just thought it was interesting because I, I because I, it's so rarely, I, I, I don't hear that a lot anymore. I, I mean, the, yes. I mean, the short answer is yes. I, it's what, what am I, what am I, what am I supposed to do? You know, am I, you know, like, am I supposed to, I'm not chasing money, you know, I'm not chasing women or fame or cocaine or anything, you know, uh, it's, it's just about, it's about this. Yeah. It's about expression. It's about getting deeper. It's about, you know, like when I, when I talk about, this journey, this music journey, it's like what music has given me everything somehow, somehow, um, the shirt on my back, these terrible cabinets behind me. And, and just like, it's, it's given me everything, my wife, my children, you know, somehow, um, I, I got lucky and, and I'm, I'm a Korean American jazz musician. Like what, how, I mean, seriously, how? It's and and yes, it's hard. Yes, it's been a challenge. Um, I, all of the things, but 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 at the end of the day, what what am I chasing? And it's just I'm chasing that moment. You know, uh, if that's 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 the thing. It's just like it's just every moment is is can be profound, and and having expression like that. And getting deeper into that idea, and and trying to say something artistically, and 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 communicating that, I I don't know. 
it's 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 overwhelming to think about and to talk about. And you mentioned before that when you're producing one album that it was it was a difficult experience for you. Yeah. Have you found that spiritual satisfaction? Have you found? I mean, I guess what I'm basically saying, it sounds like you're, it, it sounds like you're happiest when you're behind the keyboard. Playing For sure. No question. To a live audience. Um, yeah. Or just playing I mean, with other people. But playing. being in the studio sounds like a drag. <laughs> well, is it well, or is it not? No. I, I heard that as more, there's so much pressure, you know, especially if you're bringing other people in. But I, I mean, there, there, there can be my attitude toward it has, has evolved and changed, you know, over time. Uh, the, the Mo's record was just especially so, uh, because the, there were so many variables and it was like, it was in some ways, a, a more specific thing that, that, that we were doing. Right. Whereas fifth is, is sort of more open-ended and it's really, it's less about, it, it, it's sort of less about say the songs, right. That we did for anything Mo's. And more just about get get touching something, getting closer to something, you know, getting getting closer to a, a, a greater power somehow, and 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 just kind of reaching in and trying to live in that moment and communicate that moment and and all of those things. There's no there's no pretension. There's no pretension behind it. We're not trying to be the cool kids, you know. None of that is happening. It's just right. we're just trying to make this thing right now. And, uh, and yeah, and that's what we would do every Monday night for that band. Mm. So <sighs> this is, you, you talk about Smalls, the jazz club, and you say yeah. they have, and they, they, they live stream every night. They do. Oh, we got to put that on our reference list, yeah. Jim. Yeah, yeah. I may, I may come back to you, John, with some uh, questions about links, uh, okay. but there's plenty here. Yeah. How about... How about a, a, another question? So I asked you, what's the one Keith album that you'd recommend? Is is there is there uh, now? It's just open ended. Is there an album recently released that you think people should be paying attention to? Is there something that you think is really uh, interesting? You mean any any album? Any artist, any artist, any jazz, you know, preferably, you know, because but I mean, just something that you think is. You know, I'm not, I'm not really in touch with contemporary jazz. Like I know a little bit, like I, I listen to a little bit of Brad Meldow. That's probably not even, I don't know if he's even contemporary anymore, but there is the S far something trio. You remember those guys, EST or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I've listened to a couple of other people, but I'm just not really, I'm not really plugged in terribly well. Is there something that you think is, you know, some, something that you've been listening to recently that you think other people should know about? Um, what have I been listening to? You know, I'm, uh, my, my life is like, you know, it's, it's, it's my family and my teaching. And then something that I do is I'll go to the, I actually go to the village Vanguard every week and mm -hmm. I, I go there because it's the village Vanguard and it's just this historical place. But the thing about the village Vanguard is that no matter who you are, the Village Vanguard is a is like a special gig. It's like the it can right. be the gig of a lifetime, quite frankly. Right. And right. Uh, for a jazz musician, you know, you ask a jazz musician where would you rather play the Village Vanguard or Carnegie Hall? I'd say a majority of the time, people jazz musicians will say the Village Vanguard. You know. Huh. And so it's sort of this holy place. And so, like, I go every week because I want to see everyone's special gig. And I know if I go, that all the musicians there are completely invested in that show right. <laughs> completely completely and i know it's special to them and if it's special to them it's going to be special to me i know that and so that's my that's my live music intake okay generally that's what i have time for generally um when i go out so in a way it's very pristine just because my you know whatever i'm busy so um mm -hmm. As far as listening is concerned, um, as far as an album is concerned, well, contemporary wise, the last thing I listened to that I liked was uh, Kurt Rosenwinkel had put out a solo guitar album. Hmm. 
Um, and, and he, I don't know where he recorded it. I bet he recorded it in his house, but it's just solo guitar and it is lovely. Now I, I hold him, someone like that in, in very high regard, I think he's a genius. Um, and, uh, and you know, he's, he's, you know, as far as jazz is concerned, I would regard him as a pretty successful guy, you know? Awesome. So, so, so that's lovely. That's lovely. You know, he, I, it's, I, I think he lives in Europe now. He's from Philly. And, he's from um, Philly. yeah, he's from yeah. Philly. Yeah. And, um, so that was really nice. And then you mentioned Brad Maldow. Uh, I saw, I recently saw Brad Maldow, um, at the Village Vanguard, uh, playing a solo. He did a, a week of solo piano at the Vanguard, which I've never heard of, but, but he's the one. And um, he also started a new quintet. So, um, you know, Brad's work is impeccable. He has a real knack for making, playing perfect piano all the time. Um, and so uh, there's, a, there's a, a, an album or a, a set of 10 years of solo piano music that he had released that I, I go back to often. Uh, um, <laughs> and w which i really love and um and i wouldn't say that's new that's not like just like in the last i don't know i don't know when it came out maybe in the last 10 years or something like that that's new to me 10 years is still new to me um so there there's you know um i'm probably forgetting something the, uh, a standout was in terms of contemporary like really contemporaries like uh, i don't know if you guys have heard of domi and jd beck they're they're these kids they're yeah. these like kids and I've uh, heard of them they they signed a blue note and they're doing kind of fusion uh not straight ahead jazz but really interesting fusion music and they're like they're they i don't know how old they are they look like teenagers mm. and um and that's you know they put out a record and like Snoop Dogg's on the record but also Herbie Hancock's on the record wow and Kurt Rosenwinkel's on the record you know what i mean <laughs> And, and all this, all this kind of stuff. And so like, there's that. And I love that, but, but my, but like contemporary wise, I don't know. I don't know how hip I am just on the album scene on, on what's new off the top of my head. Well, it doesn't have to be something new. So for, for example, recently, um, I just, I stumbled upon a, uh, a YouTube video really early Gary Burton, 1971 wow. Gary Burton playing, uh, uh, Che de Saudad, no more yes. blues by Antonio yes. Carlos Trabim. Yes. It is mind blowing. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. Mind. Did I send I, that to you, Jim? I believe you. No, no, you need to. Oh. I, I was just going to say, this is the part of the show where Lionel loads up my, um, to do list, but <laughs> yeah, references this for the reference list. Yeah, and then Write also the, essay, the essays of Montaigne. You got to put that in there. Oh, too, yeah, I will. I, I will. No, but no, but it's just Gary Burton. I mean, one of the pioneers of the four mallet form. He plays the vibraphone with four mallets, um, and he plays this Antonio this Joe Beam tune. The guy who wrote "Girl from Ipanema," like the whole the whole samba thing, the whole the whole Brazilian thing. He's playing it at like four hundred eighty two BPM. <laughs> flawlessly <laughs> with four mallets. It's utterly ridiculous. And he's wearing this and he's wearing, he's wearing this weird kind of Western outfit. Like he has like chaps on, he has like this leather jacket with like this tassel for it. And he has this huge 1970s mustache. And like you said, you know, you got to get past what people look like. You got to get rid of your preconceived <laughs> notions based on what people look like. And you look at Gary Burton, you're like, who's this guy? And then he sets, you know, for like three minutes and 50 seconds, he sets the world completely on fire with a vibraphone. Absolutely. Absolutely amazing. Uh, John, I want to be mindful of the fact that you have kids yeah. and uh, that it's probably bedtime. Um, but I, I also, there, <laughs> All right, nobody can see, but there is an oh. adorable child He's just on our, our video stream. Hello. 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 Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, thank you so much for spending time with us. We really yeah, appreciate it. You. This was really was a great. blast. Love your music. Everybody's got to check it out. Um, John Chin. Thanks, you guys. Uh, Thanks, you guys. This was, it was great to talk. What to a talk pleasure, really. So cool to have this conversation with you guys. And let's have another one.
at some point. I mean, yeah, tomorrow. Conversation. Tomorrow's okay. All right. Yeah, tomorrow. Well, we're back here again. <laughs> okay. We need a little bit of a ch- recharge time there for a second. Anyway. Good night, everybody. Okay. Podcast is produced by me, Jim Infantino. Music by Jim's Big Ego. This solo by Steve Sadler. You can find us wherever podcasts are found. Please leave a rating or review.